I'm going to start with our pedigree in healthcare and go through a few things just to remind you what Nigeria was when it comes to healthcare. This is UCH Ibadan. You know, when UCH was built in 1957, you had 500 bed hospitals. So just flash back yourself and say how many hospitals on earth had those number of beds at that particular time. You know, Queen Mamahoto Hospital, which the World Bank makes a lot of noise about, was built in 2001 and just has 435 beds. What was done in UCH in 57 is more than what was done in 2001. So that just... Uh, the next one I want to talk about is uh, University of Nigeria. Just after the Civil War, you know, there was open heart surgery that was done there by Professor Ayaji. I think people like Makud Yakub, you know, who were the leaders, you know, Makub was so shocked when he heard that a bunch of black people were going to do open heart surgery. I think he, 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 he came from London to make sure that it's not uh, open back surgery or that it's not a uh, surgery on, uh, on mummies or something like that. He came to Enugu to see it. I mean, just to sort of, you know, the achievements continue. You know, renal transplant. I, I mean, IVF babies are common things. Now, is it not so? It's pretty common. You know, uh, we had a young Nigerian who broke an academic record in John Hopkins University. You know, you have what is being done in uh, Delsu, you know, pacemaker implants. You know, the coronary artery catheterization, which, you know, you know, UCH does ordinarily now. You know, things like angioplasty and all that stuff. So, Nigeria has a huge pedigree, and we must recognize that. And it's important that we push that pedigree to continue. This is Jordan Wobi, you know, study and find out about him and what he's done. This is Dr. Sam Dagogo Jack. Unluckily for me, I went to Newcastle to study where Dagogo Jack had studied. Dagogo Jack was best in academics, he was best in squash, he was best in everything. And everybody thought I was Dagogo Jack, but I wasn't like. <laughs> so nobody would sit in class with me or come near me. But, and if you go to the National Health Institute in the US, he's the chairman of the research body. So it, it just tells you the sort of things that Nigerians, I mean, we have Mary here you know, whose reputation precedes her in terms of her accomplishments around the world. So when it comes to medical care and when it comes to, you know, Nigeria, it's, we've got a very huge pedigree. But, but let's look at our outcomes. You know, I did say something. You know, for me, priority number one or priority one is maternal and child health. And I keep saying that particular point, pregnancy is not an illness. You know, pregnancy is not, we cannot accept the situation where we, we men, if a woman is pregnant, we're not sure whether she will take the child to full term or she will die in the process. You know, the sort of figures. One thing I want to challenge Nigerian Health Watch is, please, can you start this year, you know, to publish an annual state of mothers and child report? That is something that's very needed for our country because that will push. Let's every year publish an annual state of mothers and child report to let people know you know, the inequities that go so that it attracts public attention to be able. When you look at the 159 women dying every day in childbirth, what is it like? It's like you bring a boy in 737 and you fool it to a pregnant woman and crash one every day. If it's not an emergency, what again is an emergency? That is very, very important. And this is gap minder world, you know, uh, you know, where we fit in around the world in healthcare. I, I don't want to spend... We are in a very bad neighborhood, and we have no reason to be because of our prosperity in terms of wealth and, uh, and potential. You know, all the challenges we have, I think I've mentioned some of them, maternal mortality, infant, wrong diagnosis, poor sanitation, you know, corruption, everything. Those are challenges we face. And opportunities for healthcare. You know, there's partnership opportunities around the world that we can use to substantially improve healthcare outcomes in our country. Now, investing in healthcare, anybody who was here last year in March, when Dr. Soji Adeyi, you know, he heard, you know, what came and talked, you know, when you invest in healthcare, it leads to economic growth. That's something that is important to realize. If you look at the East Asian countries, improvement in healthcare preceded economic, you know, growth. So things like, you know, child nutrition, it's a necessary condition to develop the brain infrastructure. If a child is not fed very well, you know, the risk of, you know, you know, inappropriate development of the brain is there. You know, if you watch rapid decline in fertility, no country has seen that transition without being preceded by a decline in under five mortality rate. Those are critical things that we know. It's evidence that's available there that is a basis for public policy and for us to work. 
I mean, these are the charts. You know, this is real. Look at South Korea. You can see that improvement in healthcare occurred before economic growth. Look at Malaysia, the same. So it's extremely important that as a condition president for our development, we must invest in healthcare to develop our people. A healthy nation is what? A wealthy nation. So public-private partnerships are, are pretty very key, you know, to driving, which is the focus of my presentation, where the private sector comes in and finances infrastructure and provides, uh, you know, services. This is not a PPP cost, so I'm just going to sort of try to push and, you know, stress on the critical thing. That's your definition of PPP is what it is, and you can get the slides. You know, this is how it drives, you know, progress and development. Um, this is the framework for it in Nigeria. I want to go quickly to... Now, these are the opportunities where we can work with the private sector, provide good health care, you know, power, waste management, etc. Now, these are the focus areas in Nigeria that we can bring in the private sector to improve health care, you know, for Nigerians. What are the hosts for improvement? Well, the basic health care provision is pretty very, very critical. You know, it's, it's, and I'm very grateful, and I want to thank His Excellency President Muhammad Buhari for his political will to finally make that happen. So let's give him a round of applause. That has happened. That's something we should be very, very proud about. So what you've seen that has happened is the capital budget for the health sector, it's the largest it's been in years. It's the sixth largest, 90 billion naira, with funding clearly provided for the basic health care provision. So we want to make sure that those things are... The health ministry is here and probably will speak a bit more about the basic health care. Now, the ICRUC, we are working with the Federal Ministry of Health to introduce managed equipment schemes to rapidly improve health care facilities across our country. Now, I'm going to talk more about the concession of Gariki Hospital because Gariki is a truly good example. And there is a book about the Gariki Hospital experience in PPPs and how it's improved. I've got five copies of it. I'll give to Nigeria Health Watch and then they can do uh, you know, what they like uh, with it. This is just, uh, if you look at Gariki, yeah, this is Gariki Hospital, you know. Gariki Hospital is, I mean, it's able to do open heart, you know, heart surgeries. It's able to do kidney transplants. In fact, in 2013, it did three kidney transplants in one day. That, that's what private sector can do. Just look at facilities. This is what the hospital was before, you know, the concessioning. And that's what it looks like. And you can actually dive in deep into it. This is what the theater looked like before concessioning. You know, that's what the theater looks like now. Which theater would you prefer to be operated on? You see, if you're taken to this theater, even if you're not sick, you may... <laughs> but if you get to this one and you're very sick, what will happen? Just getting into there will give you confidence that you can be very well taken care of. It didn't have an ICU before, but that's what the ICU is like. This is what the radiology was before, you know, the private sector investment. This is what the radiology is like. So that, that's a typical example. You also have it successfully in UCH, and I'm very happy that Professor Alonge is documenting what is happening in UCH. I mean, this book is not yet out, but I'm reviewing it, and I don't have his permission, to but I just wanted to show that you know, public-private partnership across our teaching hospitals, it's very, very key for us to drive quality outcome. This is what they've done with MRIs and magnetic resonance imaging, you know, with the private sector. That's very, very key. Now, the other thing we're also doing is that with the teaching hospitals, we have recently approved the OBC for 22 teaching hospitals on a managed equipment basis where the private sector will come in and invest in the equipment to upscale the quality of services. And the financial model shows that this is, you know, pretty very viable and very, very, we're hoping for good success in that. We've also done the warehouse in a box, you know, which has addressed, you know, the issues around, you know, storage for health commodities. That you don't start to have that vaccines come in here and vaccines rot away because they are not well stored. So this is at the other area we want to look at. We're talking about primary health care. Mobile medical clinics are very, very key. It's worked very successfully in India. And we are pushing for the government to work with the private sector. You know, you're not going to get, you know, you know, Mary, you know where it's called Gembu? There's a place called Gembu. If I post you there as a doctor, will you live there? So, <laughs> so if you went and built a primary health hospital in Gembu and Mary doesn't live there, are you providing health care? You're providing buildings and no care. However, I'm sure she's willing to go with a medical 
mobile medical clinic, go there, provide services in a day, and then come back to Meduguri. So that's what this will drive. And this has been a very successful model in India. You know, these are the specifications. I mean, this hospital, this mobile, they attend to 150 people every day. Imagine if we had a raft of them around our country, what it would do to upscaling primary medical care. And once you upscale primary medical care, what happens to secondary and tertiary? Secondary and tertiary will now focus on what it's supposed to do. My wife is a doctor, and uh, she always used to complain that she was treating cough and kata in, in a teaching hospital. I, I don't think that's what teaching hospitals are meant to do, you know, to treat teach, you know, cough and kata. They, I don't even know whether we do any research again in our teaching hospitals, you know, because of the sheer burden of primary health first cases that come to them. So these are the services that they provide. You know, I mean, they do everything up to family you know, care services, minor surgical procedures, that is specifications. So this is also what we can do across large hospitals, you know, to provide care. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. You know, it's, it's, it's a very successful sum of models that we can work with the private sector. I just want to share something about unleashing technology. We are particularly at a very good place now where technology allows us. This is not commercial, but I'm just sharing what is possible. Anybody who knows about the Philips, uh, you know, Lumifi technology, it's, it's difficult to have, you know, uh, affordable ultrasound. But however, what Philips has done is to produce this. This is very small. You can connect it to your phone and do two-way voice imaging. So essentially, you can provide, you know, uh, you, you can provide, you know, ultrasound capacity that's beyond belief anywhere, you know, in this particular country. The BYOD there stands for bring your own device. So literally, as a health worker is moving around the country, they're carrying their, you know, device. And you can sit down in my village, Amede, and put on a pregnant woman. And then Mary is in Abuja here looking at the pictures and saying, no, no, go left, go right. That's how you provide. You take advantage of existing infrastructure to provide world-class healthcare. We have no reason not to be able to do it. You know, this is time for us to move as a country and do things like this. So this is it. You can see more of what the, this is what the technology is, the transuder does. And you can see it there. It's there connected to a phone. And you see the quality of imaging. This is as good as what you can get anywhere in the world. You can see it, you download, you connect, you scan. You know, you can see the various models that are available. And this costs, you know, between three to four thousand dollars. It's not rocket science that we cannot afford as a society to improve healthcare for our people. This is an emergency. You can see they're doing it there. It's it's I mean, this is actually paramedicals doing it inside an ambulance, and a doctor is somewhere, you know, providing advice and care. You know, this is it. it. It's everywhere. You can use it. I mean, this is a... I mean, there's a lot more, you know, technologies that... You can see what the collaboration is there. You can see. Now, what are my action plans and conclusions? I would suggest that, you know, we need to plan a major healthcare stakeholders conference where we decide our priorities and move forward. The ICRC will continue in her role you know, to champion the partnership, you know, between the public and the private sector to provide health care for Nigerians. Without health care, without good health care, we are going nowhere. Like, you know, I worked in the oil industry before I came to government. There's a famous thing we say in worry, if act or die, film don't finish. Is it not so? Any film you are watching, once they kill the actor, the next thing you see what? The credits, the end. So let's know that if act or die, film don't finish in Nigeria. And the actor could be you, you know, or me. The other one is that will, we appeal to development finance institutions like the World Bank to help us, you know, to drive these processes as has happened in other parts of the world. The private sector should partner with the public sector to ensure that we can provide facilities that would guarantee the future of, uh, of Nigerians. I'd like to end by my usual thing. You know, if you go to Yankari Games Reserve today, and you see a uh, gazelle. The gazelle knows that it must run faster than the slowest lion, or it will be dead meat. If you also see a lion, the lion knows it must run faster than the slowest gazelle, or it will starve to death. So my dear brothers and sisters, it doesn't matter whether you're a lion or a gazelle. When you wake up, what do you do? You start to run to develop healthcare in Nigeria. Because the life you save may be yours. 
your uncle, your brother, your sister, your mother, your child. God bless you. Thank you very much.